welcome everybody to Unbound, the Bay Area Book Festival's uh, series of virtual conversations. I'm Ishmael Mohammed, the criticism editor at The Believer. I'll be your moderator for today's writer-to-writer -writer discussion between two incredible poets. Um, today's conversation, The Beautiful Witness We Bear, is between two poets and thinkers. His work has really been guiding uh, my thinking a lot over the last few, few weeks in American history. Um, the poets are Jericho Brown, author of several collections, including most recently the Pulitzer Prize winning The Tradition. Um, Jericho is also my colleague at The Believer, the poetry editor. We're very lucky to have him there. Uh, and the eminent Nikki Finney, the national award winning, uh, book award winning poet. His most recent con uh, collection, Love Child's Hotbed um, of Occasional Poetry, was published in April. It's really good. You should definitely grab both those books. Um, to get at why I think Nikki and Jericho are, uh, and their work is so important for the historical moment we find ourselves in, I just want to read the epigraph from uh, Love Child's Hotbed, which is, which is from Langston Hughes. Uh, quote, I'm laying off political poetry for a while, though since the world situation, methinks, is too complicated for so simple an art. I am going back, indeed have gone, to nature, Negroes, and love. Uh, and to me, that epigraph speaks to part of what binds these poets together. Um, their dedication not to political poetry, but politically engaged poetry that is about Black people, Black life, and Black lives. They get to their politics through a careful examination of Blackness and the poetic forms as such an examination uh, excavates. And I think that at a moment where the political rhetoric might threaten to overwhelm the Black social life, it's meant to protect and advance. Uh, Jericho and Nikki's work reminds us exactly what we're fighting for. Uh, so I want to thank you two for being here, here virtually, at this moment uh, with us. I have some questions about witness, about social form and poetic form, but first I just want to start off with, a, with the most important question. Um, how are you two doing right now? Like, What's keeping you afloat? What's giving you life, uh, Jericho? I'm, I'm traumatized. <laughs> um, my heart is broken. You know, uh, you know this, Ismail, and, and Nikki knows this as well. Um, we, uh, one of the ways we know we're magical people is by how much we manage to do with broken hearts. Um, I, uh, I, I, I understand that I'm a person who can't handle that which everyone else can handle. I am indeed that cliched, sensitive poet. So I've been avoiding the news, um, but it's very difficult to avoid the news when the news is as big as it is now. Uh, and so I'm sending, um, I'm trying my best to tap into all of the love, joy, and gratitude that I can so that I can send that energy because I believe in, I believe that I can do that. I can send that energy to all the people who are indeed in this moment, in the midst of this pandemic, um, risking their lives to make a necessary statement. Uh, and I want us to know that the statement that they are making is indeed a necessary one um, and it does make a difference. I think uh, we can get very um, skeptical of protest and I am interested in the fact that uh, no matter what our skepticism may be, um, using your body uh, to create the drama of protest does indeed change things and make more people aware of certain problems that they may not have otherwise been aware of. And so, um, and so I, I'm glad to be here with you, Ismail. Thank you so much for saying all those nice things about, about me. And I'm always happy to be with my, my teacher, Nikki Finney, um, who I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't know how to write if it weren't for her. So I thank God for her. Uh, but Ismail, you know, you read that Langston Hughes poem and I'm sensitive right now. I, I, I had to get myself together. Don't run my makeup. Okay. <laughs> That's so does that answer? I started talking. <laughs> I started talking. Um, but I think uh, Nikki might want to answer as well. Yeah. How are you doing? You know, we we work with words, right? We do we do words. Um, Morrison taught us, and others have taught us. And I've been scribbling a lot uh, using. The broken heart, uh, the letters of the broken heart to, to write. And uh, 
I don't really want, I want to be here with you, Jericho, and I want to be here with you, Ismael, but I really don't want to be here. I really don't want the light on me. I really don't want to do this. And yet um, we step forward to hold each other and to, and to say, you okay? You all right? I'm looking for you. I've been wanting to do this with Jericho maybe for 20 years. It took him uh, winning the Pulitzer Prize to like, you know, I got an invitation, so I'm I'm good now. I'm good. I think um, I feel like I've made it across uh, oh. the Chattahoochee or something. I don't know. Um, I just this is. I am full of. Uh, I'm full of wonder. I'm full of um, joy. I am full of uh, pain. I refuse once again to allow the brutality of white supremacy to define how I ultimately feel, how I uh, open my eyes in the morning or close them at night. And it is work. It is work every single day. Mm -hmm. um, it is impossible to tell you how I'm doing because it changes um, by the minute. Fury, one minute. Um, tears, the next. Uh, pulling Audre Lorde off the shelf, the next. And so one of the things that keeps my chin above the waterline is absolutely those who came before me, who went through what we are going through now in their own time. Mm -hmm. And I try to um, reach out for uh, some younger people, human beings who uh, may not have that sort of barrier and buoy that I have with that relationship with um, the culture and the history. So, so that's how I'm doing. Thank you both so much um, I mean, for those beautiful and thoughtful answers. Um, I'm kind of going off script on this, but I wonder just because you, you are both teachers and I assume you, you were both teaching uh, this past spring, um, how, how was teaching kind of entered into how you're encountering this moment is working with with students and younger uh writers and and mentees mm -hmm. um Nick, nikki well the pandemic, pandemic hit, hit and everything flipped uh the class that i was going to face to face became a virtual class um and which was very, um, I am a analog girl in a digital world, period. And so I had to switch gears and, you know, I had to like, I had to get to the surface of that. And so that was in and of itself a challenge. And I don't, I don't think in all honesty, I don't think I was a good teacher the last six weeks of my semester. I feel like and I haven't said this to my students yet because I've been writing them and, and, and then deleting the letter. But I, I feel like I let them down because I feel like physically when I'm in a classroom, I know what to do. And I feel like when I'm on a screen with them, I can't, I, it just was I was lost uh, for a, a while. But we 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 pushed through and got to the end of it. But it was it was it was um, it was a it was an adventure and it was a journey. And I wish I had those six weeks back because I know more about um, how to swim those waters now than I did, you know, with 48 hours notice, basically. Mm -hmm. But as a teacher, I, um, I, I want to impart what I know back into the water. And I feel like I've been doing that for 30 years of my life. And in, in fact, <laughs> it's a good segue to when I, how I met Jericho who wasn't Jericho when I met him, but he was Jericho, but he wasn't Jericho. He was in his spirit, but he wasn't by name. And that's how far we go back. And I just want to say, cause I've always wanted to say this, I've, I've written it in my journal books, but I haven't said it to him. Um, he was one of the hungriest, one of the most brilliant young writers that I ever met in the moment. Of, of my, that was year 2000, it was 20 years ago. And he was so hungry and he was a lot quieter than he is right now. <laughs> Hard to imagine. He, he was looking for the 20 years 
that he's lived. He was looking for them. He was looking for the stepping stones. I could see that. And, you know, I gave him what I could and told him to, you know, fight out the rest of it on his own. And he did. Um, but I just, as a teacher, you, one of the things that I feel like I get really clearly with my students is a feeling, feeling like what they need, a feeling like what I can impart to them. And it's always different. It's always different, which makes teaching really the way I teach really difficult because it's not, uh, okay, everybody gets the same thing and everybody learns the same way. And I know Jericho is the same way in a different kind of way because I've talked to his, some of his students who have said that same kind of thing about him. So I think we share that in a, in a way. Um, I'll just say that uh, what I love about teaching and I, I believe what my students love about the opportunity to get the education they're getting, in particular in the workshops where, where I teach them, uh, is that it's an opportunity to tell the truth in ways that they are otherwise not going to, to be told the truth. Mm -hmm. um, the truth has been hidden from them, mostly because they're 18, 19, and 20, and 21 years old. So mm -hmm. in many cases, uh, they have been told lies uh, and if you don't put yourself in a position where you can find out the truth, you will not get it. You won't get it from the news. You definitely won't get it from your parents. You, the only place you're going to get, uh, or at least you can't count on, there are some parents who are doing it, but you can't count on getting it from your, your parents. Um, so my students give up a lot to have to deal with me. Um, and they look forward to a lot to have to deal with me. And I have the same expectation of them that we, that we tell each other the truth, um, that we say what does and what does not work in a piece, but that we also dig for the reasons why the thing is or is not working and what that has to do with where our lives and where our practice, where our discipline is intersecting with the work we're trying to do. So uh, I find that the more I teach, the more intuitive I can be about it. And uh, the more I do it, the better I am at it. It was very difficult to do over Zoom. Um, uh, I wasn't ready for that uh, and I wasn't great at it, uh, but they weren't great at it either. You know, <laughs> and my, student, my students were, were all, we were all figuring it out um, and we were all uh, displaced in, in some way or another, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think the wonderful thing about that is we had the opportunity to be tender with each other. Uh, they knew I was trying my hardest and I knew they were trying their hardest. Uh, my students, um, my students will come to my, my students know not to come to my class if they're sick because they can't come to class sick because they can't get anybody else sick and I can't get sick. I have stuff to do. I don't have time to be sick. So um, other than that, my students have to come to class and my students are always like, Dr. Brown, I got this scholarship and I have to show up in order to get the money. And I always say, okay, well, that's fine. You'll just have a C in this class, but you better go get that money. So, <laughs> they, uh, so they, they had some absences when we were over <laughs> Zoom. And they, they would call me, they all have my, had my phone number. They would call me on the phone and they said, Dr. Brown, now you know. <laughs> You cannot give me a C. And I said, you're right. I cannot give you a C. <laughs> so we had, um, we had some very interesting times and some interesting interactions. And I got the opportunity to find even more out about them than I, that I would not have otherwise uh, found out. And that was wonderful. As soon as we got out of school, though, um, Ahmaud Arbery was murdered. And so I was in the middle of... Um, finishing grades. I had just gotten the news about the Pulitzer. I was trying to finish grades so that I could act inappropriately. Um, and uh, my students were texting me and emailing me um, again, you know, um, and my students are, are black and white and um, of every kind of descent that you can imagine. And they were reaching out to me because they needed to extend what we learned in poetry to this other part of, of their lives. Um, 
And what I really loved about that is that I could hear in our conversations that they were using poems to get through that moment. You know, the wonderful thing about that Langston Hughes poem that you opened with is that I know it's true in my life that uh, when stuff like this happens, it's good to have poems, you know, like poems I've written, like bullet points or, or the tradition. It's good to have those poems around. But, you know, I've really been comforted by um, Lane is the Pretty One by Lucille Clifton or Lucy and Her Girls by Lucille Clifton, you know, uh, because then it reminds me who we really are without the threat um, that we live with. You know, without the threat, it's really about, it's about us. You know, I want to make a sandwich. I want to take a nap. You know what I mean? Um, and yet, so we're living that life, and yet we are also always under the threat. Um, and, you know, that it, your point, Jericho, about, you know, Black life without the threat, like what we live for makes me think about, um, the question of, of form. So I think what what I've been struck by, and in, in I mean, having read your book last year, Jericho, um, and in getting to read your book this spring, Nikki, is the ways in which the social kind of informs all the poetic innovation you're doing at the level of form. So and Jericho, you've written about this about kind of creating the duplex from. This like heterogeneous collection of genres and, and forms of the sonnet and the blues and the gazal. Honestly, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Gazal, <laughs> gazal um, <laughs> will do in the United States. I think they say hustle, and even then, we're pronouncing it right. You really need to produce. Right, uh, that we'll always produce. So <laughs> if you want to say it right, I, I hadn't like heard of that form until I, until I read that essay. That's great. Um, but and and so and how that heterogeneity of form like is in part mirroring the heterogeneity of your life so your blackness your queerness your southernness um and the same thing i think with with love child nikki um blackness I, queerness southernness yes right, it's the right. same <laughs> um and it's like i just like this idea of the hotbed and i'm not sure if you're thinking about the hotbed as like a separate form but when i was reading it, i was just like oh yeah the hotbed is like it's a new kind of poetic form so I, I wonder here if you can both speak about um, the relationship between kind of innovating new poetic forms and the social life that those forms spring from. And I'm, I'm assuming here that there is a connection between those two, just because I, I'm from reading your work. Um, so if I'm, if I'm wrong about that, please correct me. But um, would you want to start, Nikki? I from the from the beginning, I have been curious about how to say what I want to say. And I have not um, waited for permission from some great somebody to say, this is how you can do it. This is how you should do it. This is how, this is the only way you're going to, you know, make it through this world is to say it in this kind of way. I really have followed my own sensitive child self and curious child self. Um, even back to On Wings Made of Gauze, which was a, a the first book, just sonically listening to words has always been something I did as a young person loving words and positioning those words on the page, either as in words or um, capping them at the beginning has always had a sort of music for me. And I've continued to do that and follow that line of reasonings, uh, poetic reasoning um, in the five books. There, it's different in each one because hopefully I've grown as a human being uh, and a poet in other kinds of ways. But really letting the poem, letting what I'm saying lead me and not um, something else has really been my North Star. And in 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 Love Child, um, I'm still I'm I continue to do that same sort of um, astronaut service to words to language. I hope I mean that's what I'm I'm thinking. But I'm also using visual and if you know ephemera letters from my father and things of this sort as um, stars in that constellation of how I'm putting words together. And that felt that felt really right to me. It, you know, no one, again, I'm not, I wasn't, the worry came at the end when I saw everything, um, I, you know, lined up together. I, I did a, a conversation 
um, with David at um, Books Off the Shelf two weeks ago, and he was really focusing on the beginning of the book and how you have to walk through um, a quote by Emerson and a quote by Sandra Bland and a quote by Langston Hughes and uh, a photograph I found in an a, a antique shop. And I felt like this was the foyer for the book. And I felt like you had to, if you really wanted to get to the rest of the book, to what I wanted to tell you, um, you know, heart to heart, you had to walk through that first and allow those images and those words that I had uh, found years ago and, and put in, in my journal books to to sit with them a minute and to let them, you know, have their way with you before I ask you to open up and, and, and hear the words and, and, and be with me in that moment. And I, I don't know any, I don't know where that came from. I just know that where I am in my life and what I wanted to say in this book began to on a very empty white wall, um, be laid down like a map, first the visuals and then the poems and then the hotbeds, um, hotbeds really came from my love of gardening and being outside and knowing that those were actual seeds of thoughts and words that came from journal books that I've been keeping since I was 13 and 14 years old. So if it seems like a form, I mean, the, you know, the book people also at Northwestern, you know, looked at it at first and went, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> And I had to sort of explain it to them. And they go, oh, okay, okay, hotbed. And then people were like running to the hills when they saw the word hotbed. They were like, what are those? Are those, you know, lascivious kinds of things? I was like, no, garden, think garden. Don't think something else. So I had to like keep explaining to people. And, you know, we, we, we tend to get caught with one definition of a word and not the etymology and go back to, you know, what the word could mean, in, in you know, mm. at the source. So... Um, I'm, I love form. I just don't want to be told how to write what I'm feeling. I want to put on the page. Right. Yeah. I just, I, I, the most I can do is echo, uh, what Nikki said. I figured out, um, maybe, maybe about, I would say maybe like 15 years ago, I figured out that in order for me to exude any kind of self-love and to have any kind of pride, I would have to first figure out what things about myself I had been told I was supposed to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And I would have to reclaim those things and find ways to be proud of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing I had to do was find the things about myself that I had been told were improbable as it related to achievement, mm. um, which turned out to be a lie. You know, I actually believe what, what, the reason why Black people are capable of the highest forms of achievement in every area is because we've, first of all, had no choice but to, you know, achieve at the highest form because we, we're always taught we're, and we know it to be true that what we do, we have to do better than anyone else in order to get any recognition um, for what we do. Uh, but also because we're able to see, um, and I think a queerness is a, has, in my life has had a large part of this, we're able to see ourselves from the outside and from the inside. You know, that's, I'm not saying anything new, you know, that's Anna Julia Cooper and W.E.B. Du Bois, right? <laughs> Double consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if you can really tap into that, if you can tap into your blackness, your queerness, your, so your southernness, your mother's sonness, your sister's brotherness, right? Um, if you could tap into those things, then you can really have a greater appreciation for everything you know. And so because I'm a black writer, I know what a bop is in a way that other writers might not be aware. And because I'm a black writer, I know what a sonnet is in ways that other writers might not be aware. Um, and because I'm a black and queer writer, I know what a hustle is in way. So I have those things in ways that other people are not going to have them because they're not going to see them through the lens mm -hmm. or the lenses that I'm able to see them. And after I realize I have those things, my job is then to use them um, so I have to believe I have everything I need for my poems. Mm -hmm. 
And then I have to use everything I got that I'm aware of when I'm trying to write my poem. So the reason why the duplex emerged as this amalgamation of form is because in order to write any of those forms, I have to know them. And in order to put them, put them together, I have to be Jericho Brown. I have to be who I am, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I'm always trying to reconcile uh, my, my life and my feeling. And that comes through in my poetry. The reason I'm trying to reconcile those things, by the way, is because I think that's what integrity is, right? Um, the ability to be whoever you are all the time, no matter the audience. Um, you know, that feeling, you know, there's a, when that police station went up in flames the other night, um, you know, I love God, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I cannot pretend that I was not, that I did not have some feeling of satisfaction or come up at the, at the sight of that. And I wasn't, I wasn't out there burning the building down, mm -hmm. you know, but I was not depressed that it burned down. Mm -hmm. Do you follow what I'm saying? So I have to reconcile that. I have to be honest about that. Um, and I have to create a world where other people can be honest about that in the midst of so much confusion. And so I'm bringing these forms together to create, I brought all these forms together to create the duplex because we're walking around with people, with what people keep calling contradictions. And I don't think they're contradictions, right? If we can, if we can be honest about them, then they're, they are what makes us human. And I wanted to show humanity, you know, the allness of myself, the humanity of myself in a single form. So it was a lot of work, but I'm happy to see so many do like I, I'll pick up literary journals and I'll see people writing duplexes and that's very exciting for me. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to backtrack a little bit and kind of pick up on like I use the word impossibility, I think earlier and kind of describe. Yeah. 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 Improbability. improbability. Like, um, you know, like it smell like we're not in jail. We're not in prison. That's actually improbable. Yeah. You see what I mean? So I'm so I, so so I have to walk around. I mean, I'm walking around with that. You know, people know that, but I think the difference between the writer or maybe the artist, but definitely the writer and other people is that we have an awareness of that that every once in a while we are tapping into, right? Yeah. We're we're aware of the not. You follow what I'm saying? And this is the this is the real trouble with the pandemic is the way to keep people from getting sick means that there's no proof that we kept people from getting sick. Okay. You know what I mean? It's like the word, the word you know, so, if, so, you know, like all of these people out here upset about wearing masks, protesting, wearing a mask. Can you imagine? Don't you wish you had these problems? <laughs> all of these people protesting that kind of thing. If people don't get sick, they will say they were right. But we will say we were right, too. <laughs> so that's the kind of, but I'm aware of the not. And in the poem, I'm trying to prove the not. I'm trying to prove the negative, right? Because there are so many negatives coming at me from the outside world. And so I have to figure out where I am in it. Because people don't want to tell me who and what I am. They want to tell me what I'm not and what I can't do. And so I have to say, oh, no, you said I'm not that. So now I got to prove the opposite. I'm like working on the negative, which I don't think all writers are having to work through. Yeah. Did, does that resonate for you, Nikki, the idea of like working on, on the negative? Like, I mean, I, I think I hear so much of what Jericho was saying in, in your earlier kind of answer in terms of like not wanting anybody to tell you how to, how to use or how to use language or approach or form. Yeah. I mean, back from the beginning, when I, when I first started writing, that was true to me. I mean, it, it was anybody like my interior that I was also nurturing at the same time to try to figure out what I wanted to say and who I was, um, was also giving me, you know, clues and, and, and language that I wanted to shape myself, you know? And so you have, I was keeping a hand up with them, them being a very large group of different kinds of people from family to, uh, teachers to other people and just trying to like grow grow myself up so that I could be all those different, have all those different lenses um, that we're talking about here. I had to leave the South. Um, I feel like if I had not left the South, that I would not have um, been able to, uh, I left 
uh, when I was in my early twenties and went out speaking of the, 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 the um, Bay Area Book Festival and lived in California uh, for eight years. And those eight years were incredibly significant to, um, to me. And so to help in, in terms of what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. And, um, and I, I treasure, and one of the reasons I wanted to, to do this festival was to even, you know, to talk about that some more too, and to be, and to be accountable to um, coming back to a place where I consider home um, as a, as a poet and as a writer. Well, let's talk about uh, region a little bit. Let's, let's, let's bring up on that. Cause I think, you know, obviously you're both from the South and I, and I wonder at the way the South kind of like moves through your language um, and, and what it, what it does to your writing, but also, I mean, you both have moved around, moved around a lot and I wonder what it means to have, you know, Northern California be a part of your, um, your writerly heritage. I guess so. Like, how does form work for you, or how does region work for you and your writing, Nikki? Well, I had to um, leave uh, the black church. I had to leave my black community, um, and one of the lenses that I had to put my hands around was being a black Southern lesbian in the world, mm -hmm. and I could not do that at home. I kept thinking that you know, the devil and somebody was going to snatch my tongue or cut my head off or something because these are the images that come at you in church. Yeah. And so I landed in Oakland, California um, in 1984, 85, and it all fell away because I had a community of all kinds of people, but also black gay women who were, who embraced me, you know, um, um, opened a passageway for me and allowed one of those lenses that I had to keep sunglasses on when I was in South Carolina to, to be one of the lenses that I looked through. And it was, it, I'm, I'm grateful for that moment uh, in my life in my early twenties to sort of start shedding some of the things that you wear and you don't even know you have it on and come into a, a, a fuller blooming, hopefully um, with the work that, that was coming down the pipe. I just had to know where were you living in Oakland? Uh, I was living um, on the lake. Uh, I was living in uh, in up in the hills for a little bit, but messy, mainly um, down by Lake Merritt. Yeah, that, that okay. That's on a right. place Hayden Road. It was a was the little street that went up. Yeah, not not so affordable anymore. No, not anymore. Which is why I left. Yeah, because uh, mm -hmm. a six hundred dollar apartment is now eighteen hundred dollars. Yeah. If, if not more. If that, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and how about you, Jericho? Um, I mean, also kind of being, you know, being a Southern boy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll say things about the South, but can I just say this? I just want to, can I make a space and a moment, um, particularly since this is a Bay Area event and, um, and because it is the, I believe it's the first day of Pride, you know, happy Pride. <laughs> Maybe by the time people see this, it'll be the sixth day of Pride or something like <laughs> that. Uh, but happy pride anyway. Uh, but I just, can I just say, um, it sends chills through my body to hear a poet like Nikki Finney say live in front of people that she is a lesbian. And, I'm, and the reason why is because I was under the impression for a very long time. I mean, this is, I mean, this is really a moment that is very important to me. I was under the impression for a very long time that in order to be a black writer, I would have to put something about my identity, subjectivity and self aside. Yeah. Um, and y'all know what I'm talking about because you know that somebody had you read some James Baldwin, some Sonny's <laughs> Blues, you know, when you were in high school or college. But no, you didn't know James Baldwin was gay till you were 40. <laughs> somehow or another, this was, I mean, and the man was not hiding it, but somehow or another, everybody else was hiding it for him. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And generationally, it's a really big deal for yeah. us to be able to do what we do. Um, you know, the generation of poets bef just before Nikki Finney, 
-hmm. It's not like there weren't gay and lesbian poets (laughs) in that generation. Uh, But the black poets were in a position Mm -hmm. and believed this. And maybe it was true that they had to have one identity stand aside in Mm -hmm. order to make way for the freedom and understanding of another Mm -hmm. part of their identity. Uh, and so it's, and so we're in a brand new terrain, yeah. um, in that moment that we were not, that's new. And I don't know if people understand, you know, a lot of young people take this stuff for granted, but right. that is new. That possibility for us is new and, um, definitely new if we look at the history of black writing in this country. Yeah. And I'm grateful. Um, I'm grateful for that as a Southerner, I'll just say, uh, I've lived in in uh, the Boston area, Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts. I've lived in Houston, Texas. I lived in New Orleans, Louisiana. Shreveport, Louisiana is where I'm orig- originally from. I lived in San Diego, California. I lived in uh, I live in in Atlanta, the Atlanta metro area, and I and I lived um, for a summer in Chicago. I got a lot done that summer, so I won't count. <laughs> anyway, so I um I think part of what happens when you leave the South is that you become aware of your vernacular in ways that you were not aware of your vernacular. You know, um, I have a book, in my, a, po- a poem in my latest book called Four Day in the Morning, which is a phrase that I always heard older people say when I was growing up. Um, you know, older people would also say things like shift a robe, right? Uh, and I think they were saying that in the South in a way they weren't necessarily saying that everywhere else, you know? Uh, so there's a way that the, the sound of language and the way um, language comes to us. Ernest Gaines is a really good example of this. When you're reading or- Ernest Gaines, you really do feel like someone is telling you the story and probably on a, t- on a porch. <laughs> you don't necessarily feel the same way you feel when you're reading, you hear it. And I think that intonation, you don't really become aware of it because you're living it, or at least the case for me, I wasn't aware of those intonations until I left and I missed them. And I think missing them uh, get gave me a greater value for them and helped me understand how best to make use of them in my work. Um, I also think on the level of Im- image, because all poets are always concerned with floral and fauna. Uh, you know, what I can see in the natural world here is different from what I would see in the natural world when I was living, for instance, in Southern California. Yeah. Um, and it is also wonderful to see how where I live does enter my poems, you know, when I lived in Massachusetts, I had snow in my poems. When I lived in California, <laughs> there was sand in my poems. There were canyons. <laughs> you know, like, like, I didn't know what a canyon was. Do you know what I mean? Like, I had heard of canyons, but I hadn't really seen them. You but know? you know what, Jericho, there's a, this, I got to tell say this to you. You know the uh, writer, Jamaican writer, Lorna Goodison? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. She, she was talking one day and I said, somebody asked her from the audience. They said, Lorna, you spend six months in Jamaica and the rest of your time at the University of Michigan. And they said, why don't you just, you know, just leave Jamaica, come over and, you know, take the endowed chair or whatever. And she said, because I never want to forget the names of the flowers in Jamaica. I never want to forget the names of the fruit in Jamaica. So when you said Flora and Fauna, and I was like, Mm -hmm. she keeps one foot there Mm -hmm. because she absolutely realizes that she might be writing about some Michigan snowfall or some something, but what she really cares about, mm-hmm. you know, is the bougainvillea mm-hmm. growing in her backyard mm-hmm. or the, or the Julie mangoes falling from the tree yep. that, you know, and so I just, just wanted to stamp that with some, with that story because it, I, that was 20 years ago when she said that mm-hmm. and I never forgot it. And I wasn't back in South Carolina then. I, I did not plan to come back here. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about you traveling around so much, being in California, being in the all, all those places, and then coming back to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And now we're, you know, we're one state apart from each other. We're back in, in the deep, deep South. And we're, we're appreciative of the things it gives us. But we're mm-hmm. also fighting like hell to, you know, push those things that, that keep us from being, you know, mm-hmm. or, or people coming up behind us, l- allowing them some of the space to be who they want to be as well. When I moved, when I first moved uh, to California, I had this plan, um, and the plan was for me was to be miserable. Like I expected, <laughs> like I expected to be miserable. 
And I'll never forget, I got my little office. You know, it was my first teaching job. I was teaching at the University of San Diego, um, which is really where I learned to teach. There was a huge reverence for teaching at that school, and I respect that school for that so much. But um, I, I was miserable, and I wanted to go home. I had never been so far away from home. And, um, and I remember getting my office, and I walked into my office, and I sat down, and I opened the window. And they had shutters for windows. And I looked out the window and I felt like, well, let me tell y'all what I saw. I looked out the window and I saw a magnolia tree. And it was all I could see. Yeah. And I said, Jericho, you better just stop trying to be miserable. <laughs> and it was, I mean, I didn't even know how much I love magnolia trees. And I'm, I don't think I knew that I could identify trees as well as I could. Mm -hmm. until that moment. So I think that's part of what happens in your, that sensibility uh, for the tree is what happens in your poems. Mm, yes. I, um, sorry, I'm like lost in a rapture right now just listening <laughs> to you two talk <laughs> about this stuff. Um, I, I suppose maybe we should talk about um, uh, the, the title of the, of the talk, um, just witness. Um, and Nikki, I know you describe Love Child's Hotbed as a as an exercise in occasional poems, poems, and poems, and poems, and poems. And I wonder um, how or if for the both of you, the former, the occasional poem overlaps with the question of of witness as both like a, a duty and something that's like beautiful to bear. Um, so, what is the difference between uh, writing to memorialize something? and writing as a mode of, of witnessing. I and mean, what does it even mean to witness in the first place, I suppose? I'm Jerrica. Uh, well, when I think of the poetry of witness, I just think of the ability to see, um, with, you know, with the, best, with the best writing eyes you can possibly see, uh, the complexity of anything that you have the opportunity to come across and, and to understand that, that for you, it is a unique moment. Uh, you know, um, poetry of witness uh, is a term Carolyn Forche uses a great deal. Uh, and when, when she was able to write about El Salvador in poems like The Colonel, we love that poem, uh, the poems I, I was teaching a while back and I was like, oh, or in the kernel and all the students knew exactly what I was talking about, you know. Um, she was the American poet in El Salvador at that moment and she understood that. Uh, and so you have to be aware that you're going to, as a poet, you're going to be in situations and, you're, and you have a responsibility to that situation because you'll be the only poet there. Um, and so that's sort of how I'm thinking about witness uh, that all of us have some role to play given what we see and given where we are and that I will have a role to play and I have to pay a different kind of attention uh, because I have that role to play. So uh, for instance, I live in the state that was last to close down and first to open up. Um, I'm not the only person who lives in that state, but I am one of the poets who live in that state. Um, that is the same statement, that is the same state that, uh, that before I moved to it, uh, murdered, um, executed Troy Davis. Um, before uh, executed Troy Davis, even though witnesses were rec recanting their testimony. Um, it's the same state in which uh, Ahmaud Arbery was murdered the same week I won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, so that had that, the effect that that has on me, I just have to pay attention to, and I have to get that in my poems. And when I get that in my poems, I want to see all the way around it. Um, Nikki actually taught us this um, about how to not only look at the event, but to look at uh, she did an exercise with us that I'll never forget because I still do it all the time for my own poems 
to look at that moment, but also to look at if this is happening, if this personal thing is happening to you in that moment, what's happening in your city, what's happening in your neighborhood, what's happening in your city, what's happening in the state, what's happening in the nation, what's the world news, and how are these things ricocheting off of one another? Um, if there's a world event, you can work backwards. If there's a city, if there's a nation event, you can work forward and backwards, but you can use all of these things. Uh, so I'm trying to always see around. And I think that's what being a witness, a poet, a poet of witness is about. Nikki? I, I grew up in a really small town. I had incredible um, black folks around me who loved to do things with their hands or with their minds or with their laughter or with their bodies. And what I, they were my, you know, somebody put the electricity in the houses. Somebody, Mr. Mr. Uh, um, Sinclair had a gas station with, he had one arm cause he had lost it in the Korean uh, war. And he was one black gas station and it was a black e electrician and a, a contractor. And so all these people had the responsibility of what they love to do or what they wanted to do or what they got up every morning at eight o'clock or six o'clock or four o'clock to do. And I started thinking, well, what is my responsibility? What do I get up in the morning and think about what I want to do to help somebody, to build something, to, you know, say I'm here in this world at this time. And I was, you know, poetry books in my back pocket or dinosaur books or a pencil or something. And so I began to see, not even knowing what an occasional poem was when I was nine or 15, but when people started, those people saw me writing poems and stuffing them in my pockets or saying, could you listen to this awful poem? I didn't say awful, but you know, then they would come to me and, and, and in a way of, of affirming me, say, can you write a, Miss Robinson is turning 90 on Sunday. She, She'd like a little poem from you. Why don't you? And I would go, oh, let me get to work on that right away. Terrible poem, you know, going on and on and on, just like I do now, pages of poems. But I felt like this is my responsibility. This is, someone has asked me to do something, build something to honor somebody, to honor somebody's birthday, or the church was turning 100, or uh, NAACP, you know, so there was this, I felt I felt like this was my role in this community that I grew up in. And I did not, I also found that thinking of this as work, but also thinking of as, as being inspired to write something because I had to go figure things out about Mrs. Robinson that I didn't know or do a little research or do research on the church. So I was bringing together all sides of myself in order to write this occasional poem. And so the occasional poem for me was not a bad thing. It was not uh, something that I looked down upon. It was something that I actually got charged up about because somebody thought I could make something with my hands and a pencil and some paper and some alphabets. And then it would be a part of the entire celebration that we would have in that moment, in that town for that person that we adored, that we wanted to treasure. And so I didn't intend to do this with the rest of my life. I intended to love poetry, but I, I kept building these worlds, um, not because somebody in my family or somebody in my hometown asked me, but because as Jericho was just saying, the world seemed to need this from us. We know we, 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 we who love words, we who love language, we who love story, you know, see this as us doing our part. Well, I, I think, what I really want to know is because it's like you guys have such, you two have such a long relationship, um, not only between, as one between like friends and colleagues, but between like the teacher and, and student. And I wonder um, for each of you, like reading one another's work right now, um, what, like, what surprises you about reading one another's work? Like, what do you learn about the other that you um, maybe didn't know or didn't recognize before? Before reading, uh, you know, say Jericho's poem, Nikki. You know, it's been. I I I live quietly in my in my little poet house. I don't. Um, I'm not on social media. Um, I have a Facebook page that somebody else kind of controls, but 
I have all of Jericho's books and every time a book of his comes into, into the house, um, it's an occasion. Uh, I, I, I save it because I want to read it all in one sitting for the first time. And I remember receiving the tradition and, um, because I am a garden girl and because I am a flower person, I was marveling at visually what the road was before the book got there, before the, before the, the bloom of the book itself, the sort of, sort of uh, path was um, literally strewn with the most beautiful images of a garden. And I thought, this is a perfect way to introduce what I said. I thought this at the, after I read the book, I thought that was a perfect beginning to what I then walk through as a reader and a poetry lover to get to the other side, which was the last page of the book. And I am always, I'm always um, thrilled to see Jericho not settling for the success of the book before him, before that one, but trying new things and uh, standing at the masthead of a new collection, confident and forging a new path. I think that's what matters most to me, that he never, um, that he never gets comfortable with all the success he has had um, and that he, he wants more. <laughs> yes. She started all this calling me hungry. <laughs> it's true. I want more. Um, you know, the poem, is, uh, the poem is the accomplishment. There's this mm. moment in a very recent poem by Nikki Finney where early, she has a, a what, what I'll call a purposeful anachronism. Mm. And there's a Cadillac that shows up in this poem <laughs> bef way before the invention of Cadillacs. You know this poem, Ms. Mill. And, uh, and you read that, and the poem is going so well. When you get to that Cadillac, you know this woman is getting ready to wear you out. You are prepared. Because you're like, this woman is putting this Cadillac and ain't no cause. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, I'm sorry, I get excited about poetry. So, and I remember, I remember the first time I heard her read this poem and I thank God, the first time I heard her read this poem was on a Valentine's day. You remember that Nikki Finney? Yes, yes. And, and Nikki read- It was at Princeton, poem. wasn't it? It was at Princeton. Yeah. And Nikki Finney read this poem and, uh, and she got, and the poem, what's the title of this poem, Nikki? I'm sorry. Uh, <sighs> It's you about, know. You don't know. That's what happens when you have I don't poems. know. You don't even know the titles. Yella. It's called Yella. Y-E-L-L-A-W. Yella. Y -E -L -L -A -W. Yella. Yes. So um, but later in the poem, I mean, and this is a few the poem has some link to it. Yes, it does. It stands <laughs> up. It stands up into I mean, this is I mean, this is actually if we if we want to talk about um, Nikki's place in the Pantheon. Or, or her or her contribution, you know, she's teaching us uh, about the writing of long poems and how to have life throughout a long poem from the beginning to the end of the poem, that it is possible indeed to keep us awake and alive and to feel urgency, um, which is very different uh, from a lot of the long poems that we have been asked to read in our lives. <laughs> We're just in this poem wanting to take a little nap sometimes, right? <laughs> Um, but that's not the case in Yella or or many of 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 Nikki Finney's poems. But when the Cadillac comes back, and there's a, so there's some distance before it comes back, um, it comes back in a way that is full of swagger, and um, on the part of the poet, right? Like, look what I did! Don't play with me! Don't mess with me! I know what I know. I had that Cadillac up there. I know it was an anachronism. You just and you stuck with me through it to this point, mm -hmm. but also a kind of resolution for the fact of the poem, right? Where we become much more aware of who the speaker is and what the speaker is a, is capable of in that poem. Um, and it's one of the beauties uh, that I've had. Uh, about reading her work and seeing her commitment to that, you know, um, 
we have to remember that what a poet does is be is be whoever that poet is. So you know, when you read an Allen Ginsberg poem, you know that's an Allen Ginsberg poem. Nobody has to tell you Allen Ginsberg wrote it. When you read a Lucille Clifton poem or a Gwendolyn Brooks poem, there is not confusion. If I show you daddy, you didn't have to know who Sylvia Plath wrote it to know Sylvia Plath wrote it. And what I love about Nikki's work is that she really has stood up uh, to give her contribution. She's not out here trying to uh, do somebody else's job. She's doing the job of the poetry of Nikki Finney. Uh, and I think a lot of us would be better off if we could, you know, give what we have to give. You know, Zeus has lightning bolts. Athena has wisdom. Do you follow what I'm saying? Athena is not out here trying to shoot deer because she knows that that's Artemis's job, right? And Artemis is is not out here trying to be the sun because she understands that she's the moon. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? Um, and we have to give what only we can give. And that's what makes the difference to our poems. That's what makes them matter, that they are an individual stamp on the world that the universal world will, get, will grab a hold of. Not that they are universal, they are individual. And anybody gets access to the individual is the point at which universality comes in, is what I think. And I think Nikki's a really good, a really good example of that. Um, I think by, I mean, thank you both so much for your time, for your wisdom. Um, I think by way of closing, I just, I, not to kind of like put the like, where do you see the culture going question on your shoulders, but I wonder like what, you're hopeful about right now, moving forward. Um, what do you hope for? And maybe what, what are you fearful about, um, about our political moment, but also like the role that poetry can play in that moment? Um. I just wanna go back to the first thing um, Jericho said, because it's, a, it's the flag flying over my house outside. I heard 50 young people in the street yesterday flying the same flag saying, I want my life to be about truth. And if my life is not about truth, then, and I'm out here and you can call your curfew and you can stand there in front of me with your gun. But for nine minutes, a man had his knee on a human being's neck for the world to see. And this young man was 19 years old when he said, I had to come out here. I have to be in my truth about this enough. So I am, I don't want to talk about the White House. I don't want to talk about politics. I want to talk about young people and their deep desire to live and their deep desire to live their truth and to be their definition of free in this world. And that's what, that's what wakes me up in the morning. That's what makes me go out in the streets with them. That's what I care about. And that's what I see happening all over the country. Yeah. It's all different colors. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to, um, to us talking. I mean, in just plain old conversation more and more about um, defunding, um, the police to the point of the abolition of that institution. Uh, and I would like that to be a normal part of our discourse. I would like us to talk about that the way we, um, I mean, that's what I look forward to. That's my hope. I would like for us to talk about that uh, the way, you know, we say pass the bread, you know, um, I, as, as easy as it is for us to, see that image that Nikki just described. I would like for us to get rid of, over and over again, when we see that image and images like it, there is only one problem in the picture and we should get rid of the problem. Um, and so I would like for us to start talking about how we're what we're gonna do um, for the workforce. You know, these people, are gonna need jobs, they have skills, they have other things that they're gonna to have to be able to do um, once, once 
the institution of the police in the United States is abolished. And, and I want us to remember, when I say that, I want us to remember that in this nation, in 1855, if you said you wanted or you were interested in talking about the abolition of slavery, people thought you were crazy. People thought you were insane. And we are going to have to make some decisions toward what seems insanity, because that's the only way progress is ever made anywhere. So that's, um, that's one of the things that I'm looking forward to. Um, Nikki, Jericho, uh, I can't thank you enough for um, being here with me for this conversation at this moment. Um, at the end of this talk, uh, there'll be a link to where you, the viewer, can uh, can buy the tradition and uh, Love Child's Hotbed of Occasional Poetry. Um, they'll be shipped directly to you. Uh, I cannot rec recommend them enough uh, as really bomb for the soul in this moment, but also a kind of like uh, kick in the ass to get you to think harder about about yeah. where we are right now and where, where we can be. Um, this is not, these are not poets who do, you know, easy reading necessarily. Um, and I thank them so much for it. So again, uh, thank you, Jericho and Nikki, for, for being here with me. Um, I'm Ishmael Muhammad, and you've been watching Bay Area Book Festival Unbound. Mm -hmm.